قال الله تعالى في كتابه العزيز بدعه بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من يتع الله ورسوله فأولئك مع الذين نعم الله عليه من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن أولئك رفيقا وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من كان منكم مستنا فليستنى من قدمات وكما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم When your brothers, sisters, elders and youngsters one of the natural and a features of every human being is that he or she loves to be in a situation that they can follow footsteps of those that they look up to. Hence, younger siblings will look up to older siblings. Therefore, we have children and youngsters that will look up to athletes. You have people in every field that will always seek motivation. They will seek a pathway through those who have come before them and have already tread the path. They were the trailblazers of that path. This is natural within us. A human being is called insan, which comes from the root letters of uns. Uns, which means to seek compassion, to seek a sense of love, to seek relevance, where a human being is seeking this throughout his life, from every juncture of his life as a child, as he grows older, when he becomes a young adult, when he becomes an adult, and so on and so forth. And in this journey, or on this journey, this ins, this human being, is seeking to be relevant by following those who he thinks, or who she thinks, will be able to allow them to be successful in their fields. My dear friends, the first question that we ask ourselves is, who are we supposed to be following? And what are the conditions that they must fulfill and they must have within themselves to be worthy of us seeing, for worthy of us seeing them to be those that we can follow, those that, those that we can emulate, those that we can bring into our lives, in our children's lives, in our family's lives. One is to follow someone because they're an athlete. So you also want to be an athlete. We can, we can accept that. Another is to follow someone because they are, Allah has given them a mastery in a certain field of, of maybe um, a specific niche of work. If it's management, if it's marketing, if it's IT, we will also accept that. The other is to implement someone's lifestyle into our life, not based upon a niche, but because we actually wish to earn and to abide and to approve those characteristics in our own lives. So it's not a niche that we're following, we're following that lifestyle, we're following that mentality, we're following that perspective, we're following that pedagogy and methodology of living. But dear friends, the condition that the Prophet ﷺ gave us, that if we wish to follow someone, as all human beings need to do, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran speaks about following people, and living our lives like other people who have already come before us. وَلَئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَاهُمُ اللَّهِ فَبِهُدَاهُ مُقَتَدِي Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these were people referring to the prophets and the companions that lived a life in which Allah had guided them. So as human beings, we always seek to follow people. He then says, فَبِهُدَاهُ مُقَتَدِي Follow these people because they've already made it. And also he creates a, a template that if we wish to follow someone, they must fit this criteria. Not in a niche of our life, not in us being physicians or us being engineers or us being students in a certain, certain skill set, but in us being human beings and us being family members and us being husbands and wives and children and parents and us hoping to implement a lifestyle into our life. And dear friends, if we think about it, before the coming of the Prophet there was no community that was drowning in the ditches of depression and failure and crisis and chaos more so than the community that was present before the coming of our Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The norm of that community was equivalent if not worse than the norms that we see today. That every vice that could have been thought of was not only present, was popular in their community. Disrespecting their elders, a lack of chastity, a lack of loyalty, burying their own daughters alive. And when the Romans and the Persians would be told, why don't you force, why don't you march upon the people of the Hijaz as you have conquered the rest of the world? Why ignore these people? They would respond by saying, these are people not worth ruling. They're just not worth it. They will exhaust our resources and give us nothing in return. We'd rather just ignore them. How is it possible that in the span of 40 to 50 years, the same people that the world saw not worthy of being ruled, became the rulers of the world. What changed? It wasn't the literacy levels. It wasn't 
the level of it wasn't their their, their socio economical um, abilities and their backgrounds changing. It wasn't their lineages changing. What changed is that they were given a system and a concept and a construct to follow, which brought the best out of them, which allowed them to be not only civil but condo conducive to the growth of the people around them. They allowed themselves to be used to benefit people. And this is what Muslim says, if you want to follow someone, the person must have this condition. مَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مُسْتَنَّنْ فَلْيَسْتَنَّ مِمَنْ قَدَمَاتِ That if we wish to follow someone's lifestyle, so an online personality that becomes famous for this or that, speaks about this topic, speaks about relationships, Muslim says, if you want to follow someone, not just listen, but ha listening is also interesting. What Hassan Basra Rahimullah says, the moment you give your ear to someone, you've, you, you've given your heart and brain to them. Because now they start planting seeds in your mind. So even the people that we listen to, we have to be wary of it. And so the Prophet says, Akuna aliman, become a scholar. And he said, if you can't become a scholar, kun muta'allim, become a student of knowledge. And if you're unable to become a student of knowledge, kun muhibban, become someone who loves the people of knowledge. And he says, if you cannot become someone who loves the people of knowledge, Kun mustami'an. Be a person who listens to the people of knowledge. Meaning, just listening is a part of the merit of this individual. Just listening creates a sense of benefit for this person. This is why when the Quran is being reset, we're told, فَاسْتَمِعُوا So even the people that we're listening to, the people that we tune into, the people that we choose to bring into our, our homes and our living rooms, be it male or female, that person is speaking from a lens that they have created. Because every system in this world, every institution in this world, the moment they initiate their institutions, they redefine the definitions of words. Because they, those definitions benefit their missions. Those definitions benefit their systems. Those definitions benefit their vision. Similar to that was the coming of our Habib in Islam, وسلم, that the Prophet redefined the definitions of words, what it meant to be a person, what it meant to be even honorable and, 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 and humiliated. What it meant to be victorious or what it meant to be in loss. That victory is not for a person who is applauded in this world. Victory is for a person who is applauded by the angels the moment they leave this world. That the world may see people to be in a loss, but that's not a loss for them because Allah is saying, that's a victory for them. Not for us. But for them it's a victory. Hudaybiyyah was a victory for the Prophet ﷺ. He redefined the meaning of poverty. When he would ask people, what does poverty mean? They would say that person has no money. He would say, no. Poverty is a person, poor is a person, or impoverished is a person, who comes on the day of judgment, expecting that there is a lot of reward that is held for them. But slowly but surely, because they backbit, they lie, they slandered, all of their good deeds go to someone else. Similarly, he, redefi he redefined the meaning of masculinity. He redefined the meaning of what relationships should look like. Prior to, coming, prior to the coming of our Habib, what the relationships were like, and after his teachings, is a night and day difference. It's a night and day difference because they followed the construct that he set and the lifestyle that he set where he was able to become the Qudwa, the role model for all of those companions. It wasn't some online person who simply has a, a number of views that speaks about how you should treat your husband or wife, but rather, We turn towards those who have already left this world because they left with Iman. We look at how Allah, we look at how their endings were. We look at how they lived their lives. And for that purpose, we have the Prophet, we have Sahabas, we have our Salaf. And the person may say, but they're not as relevant. And the answer to that would be, the rel their being irrelevant is, is, a, is, is, a, is a form of subjectivity of yours. That's your subjectivity, that they're not relevant. Because there's no way in the world that the Prophet's Sunnah is not relevant today. There is no way in the world that the Prophet's Sahaba's lives are not relevant today. If they were not to be relevant, they would not be. They would not have been preserved at the way they are. It's the lens that we wear, the lens of the world that have been given to us. So the people that dictate how we treat the loved ones around us cannot be people who don't love us. 
Those people have to be individuals who also love us. We would never take advice from someone on a day-to-day -day situation that doesn't know us, that doesn't love us. So how is it so that we allow people who are simply personalities in different places of this world to dictate how we treat people? Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, in order to take advice from someone, they must possess at least three qualities. Three qualities. The first one is that they have to be a nasih, meaning that they have a sense of love for you. They actually have genuine love for this person. Number two, meaning that they don't have an incentive. There's no angle for them that if you do this or do that, their system benefits. Or the, 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 the construct that they stand for, it's inflated. No, there is no benefit. There is no incentive. Number two, this person is mutajarra. They have experience in that field. And number three, the person has taqwa. That the person could be very well experienced. The person may even love us. But the fact of the matter is that if this person doesn't have the God consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their life, they will, they will give us or they will advise us with solutions that, are, that will earn the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So who do we follow? We follow a system which saved our societies 1440 years ago, which was the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which he taught us. What it, mean, what it meant to be a man from both scopes and what masculinity meant from both scopes and I'll share a few narrations that will hopefully draw an image for us to understand what it meant to be this individual or this personality. But amongst these beautiful narrations where the Prophet taught us how to live like humans and by extension how to live like males and females and the whole idea of always thinking that our religion is, is irrelevant and that our concepts are strange because of the times that we live in, is also, it, it's also a, a, a push from, 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 from shaitan himself. Because when people start saying things like, your systems are strange, and what you abide by as a female or a male is strange, or what you find to be relevant as a husband or wife is strange, and we agree with him, that's saying that what our prophet gave us is strange. Or what our religion gave us was strange and uh, the simple answer that I would ask for all of us to remember is we can only agree upon the definition of what strange is if we're able to agree upon what the meaning of normal is. We live in a time where faster than the evolvement of our indus industries, technology, you know, ev everything around us that is evolving and changing, faster than that, there is a there is a Evolvement, a continuous morphing of concepts and things are normal. That which was normal five years ago is not normal today. And that which is normal today will not be normal in a few years because of how quickly the world is evolving or depreciating. But the fact of the matter doesn't change that if they say that our system is strange, we ask them, by whose definition of what normal is? We can only agree upon the fact that we're strange if we agree that we if we agree to your definition of what normal is. And the reality of our time is that every single person is a stranger to someone else's definition of what normal is. Every person is a stranger to this person's concept, to this person's ism, to this person's theology or methodology. That's the reality of our life. So if we rather be stranger to their systems and be normal in the systems of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he gave us a system that will be relevant till the end of time because Allah had told us, follow that system. Whosoever follows that system, not a system that is only for prayer, not a religion that came down for, to simply teach us how to fast or how to give zakat. Our religion was, 20% of our religion is found in the masjid. 80% of it is found within the homes and our businesses. And we choose to abide by the 20% hardly, and the 80% becomes something that we say is a culture. That it's a part of our culture to respond to our spouses like this. It's a part of our culture to stand up for our parents. It's a part of our culture not to make sure that we eat before our father eats. That is not a culture thing. That is a, that is a purely, that's a concept that purely comes from our religion that teaches us etiquettes. There is no culture that is worth standing for if that culture removes the construct of etiquettes. If someone tells us that we're not supposed to be kind to our parents or to our spouses or to our 
whoever our loved ones are because that just looks weird in our culture. We say that's not a culture that we want to live by because etiquettes are something which is innate within human beings. Only our systems of, of our societies have stripped us of these normal etiquettes. But nonetheless, the Prophet ﷺ taught us the most relevant concepts for the masjid, for our homes, for our families, for males and females. The man who ran the kingdom in the domain of this Islamic empire, the, the level of love he had for the people that were close to him. We oftentimes find ourselves to be people who are kind to those who are strangers to us because there's a benefit for us. When was the last time we were able to cultivate a relationship in which we were not the beneficiary in? The other person was a beneficiary. When was the last time, even in today's time, even our handshakes are calculated. That I will shake someone's hand because I can benefit from them. I will meet this person because there's a benefit for me. Whereas Prophet taught us that the greatest level of character is when people interact with others to benefit them. They're always looking to see how can I benefit this person? Not how can I take benefit from them? In today's time in our relationships, we're always trying, there's like the seesaw, where we're always trying to be equal. We always want to make sure that the benefit that we're receiving is justified, the benefit that we're giving is justified by the benefits that we're receiving. And every person, husband, wife, specifically because of the topic and the theme that we have, Always, we're always trying to figure out, I'm doing too much now. But well, that person is doing too less. She's doing too less. He's doing too much. But dear friends, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this concept called Ihsan. It's called Ihsan. And the definition of Ihsan in English is excellence. Or you could say the pursuit of perfection. To make something as nearly perfect or excellent as you possibly can. The definition of Ihsan in our tradition for the beautiful hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam where he asked the Prophet what does Ihsan mean all of you may, many of you may have heard the hadith where the Prophet responded by saying that it's worship Allah as if you can see him if you cannot see him then know that he can see you my dear friends Ihsan is the epitome of a person's worship that's the highest they can get they can't get higher than Ihsan this definition of Ihsan however is confined to areas of worship in ibadah. This definition of ihsan has no presence in how we treat and deal with each other. This definition of ihsan is how we pray, how we recite Quran, how we fast, how we give charity. That do all of these deeds with this mentality. So the question is, what is ihsan when it comes to our, our spousal relationships? our families, our children. What is Ihsan in that? In this Imam Ghazali, Imam Ghazali rahimullah, he says, Ihsan for relationships is أن تعطي أكثر مما تسأل that a person that is a muhsin in a relationship will always give more than that which they were asked for. They will always be giving more. They will always be doing more. They will always be doing more than what they're expect what what they're expected to do. That's a muhsin. They're not ticking off boxes. They're trying to grow a relationship. So they're always doing more. Yusuf salam in the Quran is in different in, in, in the surah in Surah Yusuf in seven in seven different areas. Allah subhanahu wa taala identifies him to be a muhsin, and the reason for that is because he's always doing more than what people ask him to do. They ask him about. Can you tell us what this dream means that these seven cows that were fat were eaten by seven skinny cows? He could have simply given he could have simply given them the dream interpretation. But he goes ahead and he gives them the solution. That's a muhsin. That a person who always does more than what they're expected to do. And a person who always takes less. Ta'khudha, they take less than what they deserve. They deserve this much. But they're okay with this. Not in the form of oppression. Not in the form of our rights being taken from us. But in the sense of, of just showing love to one another. No relationship will continue progressing and growing if everyone only does what they're supposed to do. No institution will grow if the people of that institution only come 9 to 5. Clock in and clock out. Meaning they only do what they're responsible to do. That's what the expectation is. 
institutions, corporations, businesses, and families, they grow because each person is fighting to do more than the other person. That's what a muhsin is. There's no such thing as mukafa. La takunu imma'a. The Prophet says, don't be a person who's always trying to be equal. Who's always trying to just make sure that they're in the same scale as the person across the board from them. Rather, he says, be a person that asa'u ilayk ahsan ahsanta ilayhim. That when someone does wrong to you, you go back and do good to them. This, these narrations that come about doing good to people are primarily found in the chapters of hadith that discuss the matters of the family, the matters of the home, not matters outside the home. So bringing it back to how the Prophet dealt with these things, this is the mentality. The mentality was to be a muhsin. The mentality was to always do more. The mentality was to always be the hand that benefits, not the hand that receives. The hand that is above is always going to be better than the hand that is below. We live in a capitalistic society such and to such an extent that we always want to be a consumer. We always want to be a beneficiary. So he sets the tone. Mentality is be a muhsin. Number two, to always want to benefit people. Always try to benefit people to the best of our ability. And then I'll give a few stories where the Prophet shows this level of softness and in some stories where he shows a level of sternness as a man in his relationships. In one narration it comes when the Prophet is in his home and Aisha and the Prophet get into a real argument. The Prophet got into arguments. The Prophet disagreed with his wives and his wives disagreed with him. These were moments that took place in the best households. And it took place in it takes place in all the households that we see in our families. It's a part of the relationship. It's not about if we are good, it's about what we do afterwards, as the Prophet teaches us, as the Prophet tells us. You know, it, it's interesting. A, a sign of a person who has strong faith and a level of emotional intelligence and maturity is that their responses are not dictated by their emotions. Their responses are not dictated by their emotions. Their responses are dictated by their ethics and, and principles. That regardless of what has happened to me today, I come back home from work after a long day and I've been, you know, beaten by my, I've been railed by my boss and this and that. 